microphone on? Yes, I can hear that. So, <clears throat> all right, so good to be here with you today. And uh, uh, I noticed that I have a lot of friends that that's come from uh, Euclid Avenue Baptist Church. There, they closed their doors for a little bit, and so thank you for coming. And that's uh, what many of the strangers are uh, here. <laughs> and, uh, uh, so it's good to see you. And this is the first time that I've been to church in five months. And so it's uh, it's uh, really nice and feels a little odd and might take me a little bit to kind of get settled settled here, uh, settled in. And, uh, you know, with uh, <clears throat> with the COVID around and all the instructions they, that they give about wearing masks and, and all of that, uh, uh, it turns out my uh, we're a little extra careful. I'm very fortunate that my mother-in-law lives with us. She's just turned 90 years old. And so she's uh, one of those at risk, you know, in the at risk group. I'm also type two diabetic, and so I'm supposed to be in that risk group too. And so uh, my wife's a nurse, and she just uh, really makes us toe the line. And uh, so this is the first time in five months that I've been to church, and uh, the largest crowd I've been with. And so it's uh, it's really nice. And of course, I've known the, the Stan and Ham and the, the Hill family for quite a while, and. Uh, I don't have to tell you, but you know that that uh, Stan and Pam, they're both really just uh, just wonderful, wonderful people, wonderful servants of the Lord, and uh, you, you're just very blessed, I know, to, to have them working here with you, and of course, their family, and so it's really good to be here with you, and uh, I, I mentioned to you that, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I always get nervous when I, when I preach, but I, I think because I haven't done it in so long, I was a little nervous last night, went to sleep, and, and I had the strangest dream. I dreamed that I that I died and went to heaven, and I was standing there, got in line to, <clears throat> to you know, going through the pearly gates, and St. Peter was there checking to see if my name was in the Lamb's Book of Life, and I got to looking around, and I looked around, and, and I saw Ben, and Ben, he was walking around, but he had the ugliest woman I'd ever seen in my life on his arm, and he was walking around heaven, and so I, I said, hey, Peter, I, I know Ben loves the Lord. I knew he'd be here. How come he's walking around with that ugly woman? And Ben and and uh, Saint Peter said, "Well, Ben just barely made it, <laughs> and he gets into heaven. But part of his punishment is he has to walk around with that ugly woman on his arm for for eternity." And so Peter went back to look at his book. I looked around, and, and then I saw Glenn, and uh, and and Glenn, he also had the ugliest woman I've ever seen <laughs> walking around on his arm. And I, I said, uh, Saint Peter, I said, uh, I knew Glenn would be here, but. Why does he have that ugly woman on his arm? He said, well, Glenn just barely made it. And uh, he gets into heaven, but part of his punishment is he has to walk through eternity with that ugly woman. Well, I got to look around, then I saw Stan. And Stan had Dolly Parton on his arm. <laughs> and I said, I, said uh, I knew Stan would be here, but how come the other two, they have the ugly women, and Stan gets to walk around with, with Dolly Parton? And Peter said, well, you see Dolly just just barely made it. And, uh, so, so Stan, if, Stan, if you're listening, that's for you. All right. All right. Well, this morning, let, let, let's pray and we'll get started. Father, we thank you so much for your great love for us. And how wonderful it is just to simply be here in your house on your day with uh, God's people together raising our voices in song to you and worshiping you dear lord and it's wonderful to study your word and most of all thank you lord jesus I, I, for, for being our savior as i look around well lord you know every heart but uh, probably everyone here already knows you and father it's just good to be here in this fellowship we ask you uh, we know your presence is here and we ask you just to just to bring us closer to you for us in jesus name we pray amen well, this morning I'm going to be speaking on how to face the storms of life. Now, that's not a typo. Usually we say how to face the storms of life, but we're talking about how to face the storms of life. You know, uh, we all face storms, but you have ability to face the storms of life. Faith is more than just a noun, it's also a verb. Well, in our text today, we're going to look and see Jesus and his disciples. They were crossing, they were planning to cross the Sea of Galilee. And uh, I thought it was unusual because as I walked in and, and when you walk out, you probably will see this picture right here on the wall. So stop and take a look at it. And uh, uh, because that's, that's uh, the, my, my message this morning, what I'm preaching on. They're crossing the Sea of Galilee. And actually, the Sea of Galilee is a fresh water lake. 
It sits, six, it sits 600 feet below sea level, and so it's the lowest lake in the world. It's about 14 miles long and seven miles wide, and it's shaped like a harp. And on any given night, it should have taken the disciples about three hours to either sail or to row across it. And so the disciples and Jesus, they're starting on a three-hour tour. Well, the weather started getting rough. The tiny ship was tossed. If not for the courage of the fearless Lord, the disciples would be lost. How many of you have seen Gilligan's Island before? <laughs> All right, there you go. Well, let's look at Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. I'm re reading from the NIV uh, 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 version, Mark 4, 35 through 41. Well, that day when the evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. Well, a furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. Well, the disciples woke him up and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Why do you have no faith? They were terrified, and they asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Well, this is one of my favorite paintings right here. Uh, it's called The Storm on the Sea of Galilee. You can look it up on the internet. It might say Jesus in the Storm on the Sea of Galilee. And it was painted by Rembrandt. He painted it in 1632. And you've got it hanging on your wall out there. It was, on, it was on display for many years in an art museum in Boston, and it was stolen in 1990. It's still not been recovered. Its whereabouts are still unknown. And so it's the most valuable painting uh, heist in U.S. history. And if you're visiting a friend and see it in his basement or vacation home, be sure to call the FBI because you can make $5 million if you do that, if uh, they, uh, they recover it. But I want you to focus on the picture itself. There's this tiny boat, and it's tossed by the angry wind and waves. If you count them, there's 13 disciples because Rembrandt actually painted himself in the picture. He's the little guy. You can't see it too good. But he's the little, little guy that's hanging right there that's hanging on to the rope. He has his beret on there. And so there's 13 disciples. One of the disciples there, it looks like he's about to throw up. He's seasick. And then you have these over here that's, uh, that's focusing on the, 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 the cells and doing that work. And then you have this group that's focusing on Jesus. And as Rembrandt gathers, uh, looks, looks out, he's, he's, it's almost like he's saying, when you face the storms in your life, do you fearfully focus on the storms or do you faithfully focus on the Savior? Let me say that again. Do you fearfully focus on the storm or do you faithfully focus on the Savior? All of us are going through storms in, in life. If, you, if you've either been through one or you might, you might be on a little rest, a little break from one, and that's wonderful, or you might be going into one. But all of us face storms in life. And so I want to quickly talk about, mention five lessons that Jesus teaches us about facing, about how to face the storms of life. Number one, you can be close to Jesus and still encounter storms. You know, when they started out on this trip, Jesus knew all things, and when he said, let's go to the other side, he already knew that they would encounter a storm. Sometimes people who love the Lord, they think that they should be exempt from the stormy experiences of life. And you know, all, all of us feel that way some, don't we? We know that there's storms, but sometimes we feel like we ought to be exempt from them. Sometimes Christians make the mistake of thinking that if they've, uh, because they have the Lord in their life, they're going to be immune to storms, to trouble, tribulation, problems. But I want you to notice, even though Jesus was in the boat, the storm still struck. And even if Jesus is in your life, sometime you will encounter storms. There's physical storms, financial storms, emotional storms, relational storms that sometimes hit without any, without, uh, any warning at all. And just because you find yourself in a storm, excuse me just a second, just because you find yourself in a storm, it doesn't mean that God doesn't love you or that he's punishing you. 
You see, Jesus led the disciples into that storm to teach them to trust him. So let's don't be surprised when sometimes we face storms in life. Are you going through a storm right now? Well, you shouldn't be surprised. The Bible says in 1 Peter 4, 12 and 16, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you. If you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. Now, can't you just picture that little boat in the storm? Wave after wave crashed over the bow. The wind was howling. The thunder was crashing. And sometimes storms come like waves. You might be in between one wave, but there's another one coming. Kind of reminds me of a fellow who was on a ranch, and he was, being tra he was being chased by a bull. And so he jumps down in the ground, and he jumps in a hole, and the bull passes by. And when he does, the guy jumps back out. But the bull turns around and comes again. The guy jumps back down in the hole. The bull, he, he, he passes and turns around. Same thing. The guy jumps out and back in again and again. And finally, a fellow standing over at the fence says, uh, says man, why don't you just stay down in the hole? And the guy says, because there's a rattlesnake down here. And uh, that's not too far-fetched because in the Bible, the prophet Amos says in Amos 5.19, he's talking about a fellow who runs from a lion only to meet a bear. And then when he goes home, he leans against the wall, and there's a snake there. That's Amos 5.19. Well, life can be tough, and Christians aren't immune. All of us encounter storms. So you can be close to Jesus, but still encounter a storm. Number two, Jesus permits storms to test our faith. When the disciples uh, uh, woke Jesus up, he immediately asked them two questions. Here's the two questions he asked them. Why are you so afraid do you have no faith? Now, in the previous chapter, Jesus is teaching parables about faith and receiving his words in our heart. And like any good teacher, he teaches first, and then he, uh, he gives them the test. Will they trust him during the storm? Sometimes, <clears throat> and those are the questions God, God asks us. Why are you afraid? Why are you afraid? And uh, where's your faith? Why don't you have faith? You know, Susan and I, we just retired, and so life stretching out before us, it's, it's a lot of unknowns, you know, and, uh, and for all, all of you, and with this pandemic that's been going, there's a lot of unknowns, and, uh, and sometimes we get afraid, you know, but Jesus, he asked each one of us, we're his children, he says, why, why are you afraid? Why are you so afraid? And then he asks us, where is your faith? And when I stop and I think about that, then it makes me say, yeah, Lord, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, you know, I'm sorry, Lord, and kind of embarrassed, you know, I've been a Christian all the time, it shouldn't be like this, and, and I stop and I put my faith back, uh, back more into him, and so whatever you're facing in life, stop and ask yourself, why, why are you so afraid? Hey, you have a Savior, you have the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in your life, where's your faith? You know, sometimes life is good. It's like that old song, Summertime, when the living is easy, the fish are jumping and the cotton is high, your daddy's rich and your mama's good looking. So, hush little baby, don't you cry. Some of you have not heard that song. And uh, there's certainly no reason to cry when life is like that because your faith is not being tested. But you know, instead, Jesus tests our faith in the difficult times, when, when the living's not easy, when the living's sometimes hard, and the, the fish aren't jumping, and the cotton's burned, and you have no idea what's going on with Daddy and Mama, and uh, that's when God tests our faith. Here's three ways that I see. There's more than this. Three ways I see Jesus, God, test our faith. First, there's the pressure test. And this test has one question. How will you handle stress when you're at your absolute limit? How do you react when you get to the POTD? That's the point of total desperation. Kind of like a pressure cooker that's building up heat and pressure. Will you explode in anger? Or will you keep the lid on and trust God to turn until the heat turns down and finally dies down? There's that pressure test. There's also the people test. You know, sometimes God puts people in your lives who will stretch your faith. They rub you the, long, the wrong way. They seem to find that one exposed nerve you have and just grind on you. And I know sometimes this might be your spouse. I don't know about that, but we won't get any testimonies there. But, you know, sometimes those people at work or whatever, they're not just hard to love. They're just impossible to love. But, but you know that Jesus wants you to love them. So, so how do you handle that test? Do you strike out at them? 
Or do you ask Jesus to fill your heart with love and to patiently love them with the love of Jesus? There's also the persistence test. And this simply asks the question, will I maintain my commitments or will I quit? Maybe you're on task for God. There'll be a time when you want to give up. Sometimes all the external factors will tell you to throw in the towel. And uh, a weak person, he gives up too soon. But a wise person persists to the end of every commitment. And when we pass the test, God rewards us. You know, I, I, I was driving the other day, listening to the radio, and all of a sudden I heard this screeching noise, and it says, this is a test. This is only a test of the emergency broadcasting system. Well, whenever you find yourself in the midst of a test, you should, in the midst of a storm, you should say, this is t a test. This is only a test. So sometimes Jesus permits storms in our life to test our faith. Then third, Storms force us to cry out to Jesus. You know, several of the disciples were fishermen, and uh, I suspect they tried to do everything humanly possible to battle the storm. Maybe they trimmed the sails. Maybe they pointed the bow into the, uh, into the wind. They started rowing and boiling water. But soon it became apparent that their resources were not enough, so they cried out to Jesus. When they woke up Jesus, they said, Don't you care if we drowned? If we drown, you see, they weren't uh, so much afraid of the storm, they were afraid of drowning. And sometimes when we're in a storm, our mind rushes to the worst case scenario. Does that ever, I think that happens to all of us, and some of us it just seems like we're, we're more naturally leaned that way. We're th they were thinking, oh no, the ship, the ship is going to sink and we're going to drown. Have you ever thought when you're going through a storm and you said to God, God, don't you care that I'm going through a tough time? Well, listen, you don't have to ever wonder that because the Bible says that you can cast all your cares upon him for he careth for you. That's 1 Peter 5, 7. Cast all your cares upon him for he careth for you. There's a, a book that's been written. It's called No, That's Not in the Bible. And uh, it mentions things that people think in the Bible, but, it, but it's not really there. Everybody agrees that God helps those who help themselves is not in the Bible. Have you, you, you do know that that's not in the Bible. Now, uh, it doesn't, uh, Benjamin Franklin said that if you really want to know. But the author said that the one chapter that he gets the most questions and comments about is this. Have you ever heard somebody say, or, or I've said it before, God won't lay on you any more than you can bear. God won't lay on you any more than you can bear. I've said it sometimes, and you probably have too, but that's not in the Bible. The Bible actually says God won't tempt you beyond what you can resist. It's talking about temptation. It says, but he'll make a way to, to escape. But when it comes to adversity and trouble, God sometimes will allow you to be burdened to the point where you realize that there's no way that, that you can't fix the problem yourself. Now, what if the disciples had been saying, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, God won't lay on us any more than we could bear. If they had been thinking about that, oh, oh, let's don't wake up the Lord. We can handle this. After all, God won't put on us any more than we can bear. Well, the next sound you would have heard would have been blub, 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 because they probably would have drowned. You see, when life is unbearable, we are forced to cry out to God. And Paul understood this. In talking about some of his personal trials, he said, we were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, in our hearts, we felt the sentence of death. But this happened, he said, that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God. 2 Corinthians 1, 8 through 9. So you might be going through desperate times right now. You're at the point of total desperation, and you, sh you might wonder, what should I do? Well, my advice is simple. Do what the disciples did. Cry out to Jesus. Third Day has a song you're probably familiar with it called Try out, Cry Out to Jesus. And here's what the lyrics say. <clears throat> to everyone who's lost someone they love long before it was their time, you feel like the days you had were not enough when you said goodbye. And to all the people with burdens and pain keeping you back from your life, you believe that there's nothing and there's no one who can make it right. But there's hope for the hopeless, rest for the weary, and love for the broken heart. There's grace and forgiveness mercy and healing he'll meet you wherever you are cry out to jesus cry out to jesus 
And for the marriage that's struggling just to hang on, they've lost all the faith in love, they've done all they can to make it right again, still it's not enough. And for the ones who can't break the addiction and chains, you try to give up, but you come back again. Just remember that you're not alone in your shame and suffering, for there's hope for the hopeless, rest for the weary, and love for the broken heart. There's grace and forgiveness, mercy and healing. He'll meet you wherever you are. Cry out to Jesus. Cry out to Jesus. So sometimes storms force us to cry out to Jesus. And then fourth, Jesus will either calm your storm or he'll calm you. I love the fact that Jesus was asleep in the storm, and that teaches us several things. First, Jesus was a man who experienced tiredness and fatigue just like us. But we also see that he still possessed such a sense of tranquility and peace that he could sleep through a storm. There were two storms that night. There was the storm that was happening out on the sea, but there was also the emotional storm that was on the inside of the hearts of the disciples because they were filled with fear. And that fear can be more destructive than a hurricane sometimes. And so Jesus, he says to them, why are you afraid? That's what he asked us. Why are you afraid? And then Jesus spoke to the wind and the waves, and he said, hush, be still, peace, be still. Now, those are the kind of words that a mother would speak to a crying child. Hush, settle down now. And the Bible says it was completely calm. There was a great calm. In the Greek language, it says it's the word used for mega. It was mega calm. I don't know if I've ever seen, I've seen calm weather before. I don't think I've ever seen a mega calm. Well, in this case, Jesus took the storm away. But you know, sometimes Jesus doesn't remove the storm. Instead, he, he speaks to our troubled hearts and he says, hush, be still, be quiet. And when we trust him, we can experience a mega calm in our hearts. We find a peace that passes all understanding. Well, Paul, the apostle, the Paul had a storm that he called a thorn in the flesh. You're familiar with this. God didn't remove it. Instead, he gave him grace and peace to live with it. And here's what Paul wrote. To keep me from being conceited because of these surpassing great revelations, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest in me. And that's 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 9. You know, whenever we're in a storm, many times we ask God to take the storm away. Some of you might have been asking God to take a storm away for a long time, and he's not done that yet. But he's offering to give you a, an inner tranquility in the midst of of the storm <clears throat> excuse me and then finally number five if jesus is in your boat you know you'll make it through the storm now listen to that if jesus is in your boat you know you'll make it through the storm see in the midst of the storm the disciples had forgotten that Je what jesus said you remember what he says at the beginning let's go over to the other side now let me tell you once the creator of the universe makes up his mind that he's going to the other side of the lake there's nothing in heaven or on earth that would have sunk that boat. The strongest hurricane in history couldn't sink it. All of Caesar's armies and navies couldn't sink it. The devil himself couldn't sink it. They were going to arrive on the other side because Jesus had spoken that word. And Jesus has promised us that we'll make it through every storm just as well. God's never promised that we'll leave, live a storm-proof life. He just promises to be with us in the midst of the storm. In Isaiah chapter 43, verses 2 through 7, uh, Eugene Peterson, he paraphrases this. And, uh, he paraphrases it. Here's what it says. God says, when you're in over your head, I'll be with you. When you're in rough waters, you'll not go down. When you're between a rock and a hard place, it won't be a dead end because I am God, your personal God. I paid a huge price for you. That's how much you mean to me. That's how much I love you. So don't be afraid. I am with you. 
And I don't know about you, but I'd rather be in a storm with Jesus than outside the storm without him. And the lesson of the storm is simple, profound. Jesus never promised us a smooth ride, but he guarantees us a definite <clears throat> destination. Now, let me ask you this. What's the greatest maritime disaster of history? You know this. What's the, out on the ocean, what's the greatest disaster in history? Titanic. Titanic. Titanic that, that's exactly right. On April 15, 1912. You know, it wasn't a storm that sunk her. It was an iceberg. But it was also the arrogant pride of the shipbuilders. It was supposed to be an unsinkable ship, but that's all she ever did, sink. There's a lady, Mrs. Silva Caldwell, who was getting on. She, she was on that voyage, and one of the crew members said to her as she boarded, God himself could not sink this ship. And we all know the tragic story about the Titanic, how there were not enough boats there, and over 1,500 people perished in those icy waters that night. But there's a part of the story that you probably have never heard. The Titanic had been built in Belfast, Northern Ireland. And after the news of the sinking, the people of Belfast, they poured out into the streets, weeping and mourning. Grown men were embracing each other, crying bitter tears. The Titanic sh sank on a Monday, and the following Sunday at Derry Presbyterian Church, there was a great sadness there because 16 men who were members of that church were working as engineers down in the bowels of the ship, and all 16 men had drowned in those icy waters of the northern Atlantic. Well, the church on that Sunday was packed to the overflowing, and I often think about the pastor, what in the world would you say to your congregation on that day? Sixteen members had, had died in that disaster. Well, Pastor Andrew Smith chose to preach on the text that, we, that we're talking about this morning, Mark 4, verses 35 through 41. And he made an amazing statement to the grieving congregation. He said this, There is only one vessel in all of history that was truly unsinkable, the little boat occupied by the sleeping Savior. And then he added, And the only hearts that can weather the storms of life are hearts with Jesus inside. That's what the pastor said. Let me repeat that. There is only one vessel in all of history that was truly unsinkable, the little boat occupied by the sleeping Savior. And the only hearts that can weather the storms of life are hearts with Jesus inside. Did you notice the last things that the disciples asked? They said, who is this man? Even the wind and waves obey him. That's a pretty important question for each one of us to answer as well. So who is this man? Let me tell you. He's Jesus, God's son. And friends, you can trust him. I wish I could more accurately describe him to you, but he's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't fault him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't conquer him. And friends, the grave could not hold him. My friends, he's the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He's the God of the future and the God of the past. And there's no other name given among men whereby you must be saved. Friends, he's Jesus, and you can trust him. And so as we come to this invitation time, I look and I think that probably most everybody, probably everybody here has already accepted Jesus Christ. But in this little quiet time that we're going to have, uh, instead of having a walking forth invitation, let's just listen to the music and as we do, talk to the Lord. Let me ask you, are you facing, are you in the midst of storms right now? And are you, are you fear, fearfully facing the storm or are you faith, faithfully facing Jesus Christ? Are you looking at the storm or are you looking at the Savior? Jesus, he asks each one of us, uh, why are you so afraid and uh, why don't you have faith? And so let's take this time as a time to, to, re, to get close to the Lord. Let him deal with you as, as he wants to. This is his invitation to each of us to draw closer to him. And so let's do that and then we'll turn it back over um, We'll turn it back over to Dave. Would you, uh, Ben, would you play the music, please? And Lord, as we come to this time, 
I know your spirit's been speaking to each one of us. And so, Lord, we ask you just simply to speak to our hearts during this time. Maybe it's just going to be a quiet time, but that's okay. But, Lord, take this time. Each one of us, let's just pray and talk to the Lord how he's dealing with us.